Welcome to Mika Straight Up, created with support from Bank of America. In February, I had the pleasure of being one of the keynote speakers in Georgetown University's Women's Forum as part of their year-long virtual success series. And I chatted with Airbnb's global director, Marissa Moray, about the many lessons we learned during our professional journeys throughout our entire lives, and had the pleasure of answering questions from the Georgetown students who tuned in. There were a lot of them, and there were a lot of great questions. Marissa has an amazing story herself, and I'm thrilled to share our chat with the Mika Straight Up audience. I want to thank Georgetown for giving me the opportunity as well. It was truly wonderful. It was um, kind of in some ways a bummer to have to go virtual. In other ways, we're getting used to it, and it was a blast. Take a listen. Hello, and welcome to the 2022 Georgetown University Virtual Women's Forum year-long series. My name is Julia Farr, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Georgetown University Alumni Association. I'm a member of the college class of 1988, and I'm a parent of three Hoyas, classes of 19, 21, and 24. I'm very happy to be here with you today to be kicking off the fourth Pan-Campus Women's Forum. While we had originally planned to be together again this year, we couldn't pass up the opportunity to bring us all together, even if it is virtually. But as a result of our uh, pivot to this virtual format, we've been able to expand the reach of the Women's Forum either further and are thrilled to have over 1,200 Hoyas registered for today's conversation. As we kick off the Women's Forum virtual series today, our hope is that this series programming brings the same thought-provoking content to the forefront, where we can shine a light on and celebrate our Georgetown graduates and faculty as exemplars and experts. Our speaker slate over the next year features entrepreneurs, authors, wellness gurus, social media strategists, founders, chief people officers, coaches, and James Beard award-winning chefs. More than 40 different perspectives and backgrounds will be shared through the series of panels and workshops. The forum's tagline, for her, for him, for them, for all, helps illustrate not only the inclusive and intersectional philosophy driving the forum, but the fact that a more just and equitable world requires that all of us participate in the conversation. So thank you for joining today's conversation and please jump in at any point by putting your questions in the chat. I hope you'll continue and join us for many more programs that we're having your, coming your way in 2022. And finally, I'd like to thank our alumni and faculty committee who were critical in helping us to shape the content that you will experience in these conversations over the next year. It's now my distinct pleasure to welcome Mika Brzezinski and Marissa Moray. Mika is the co-host of MSNBC's Morning Joe, founder of Know Your Valley, Value, and best-selling author of many wonderful books that inspire and empower women in the workplace. She attended Georgetown University and is the current parent of her daughter serving, studying at the Law Center. Marissa is a 1991 graduate of Georgetown College and is global director of Airbnb, where she serves as the director of strategic partnerships and as Chief of Staff for the Global Policy and Communications team. I'm excited to turn it over to you, Mika and Marissa. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you, Georgetown. Thank you, Women's Forum. Hello, Hoya friends and family. And Mika, how are you? Yes, I'm here. And Marissa, it's great to be here with you. And yes, thank you to the Georgetown University Women's Forum for having us. Yes. So I know we only have an hour together. Let's go. We have so much to cover. I want to remind the uh, participants, please do not hesitate to put questions in the chat. We will have a Q&A at the end. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to get started, Mika. Uh, you are so well known for Morning Joes, right? You've been there for over a decade, but mm -hmm. you started there when you were 40, right? So yeah. I'm curious about pre-Morning Joe, Mika, mm. your career path. There was so much. Um, and, you know, actually I thought 40 would be the end, which is kind of um, something we should talk about. Um, yeah. But the career path before, and by the way, if you can believe it, Morning Joe is celebrating its 15th year this May. Um, and Joe, Willie, and I are the longest running anchor team on television. 
Yeah. Um, so we're feeling kind of old, but kind of bold and excited about the future. As we're going uh, into the spring, we're announcing a fourth hour, just announced yesterday. Um, so <laughs> we're good. thanks, I think. I think. I'm not sure, but I think. Um, but pre-morning, Joe, um, and you know, I want to throw the same question back to you because um, everybody wants to know how you got where you are. Um, but I, I did the traditional route, started in local news, and I was in local news for 15 years. Went to uh, went to network, got my first network job, then jumped to cable, then went back to network, then got fired. Um, kind of that was a big defining moment in my career life. And, um, and then finally ended up back on cable again on a morning political talk show that dominates three hours every morning and now apparently four hours every morning. So it was a career that had a lot of highs and a lot of lows, um, which added up to finally getting to Morning Joe, which was really a, a dream job, kind of a perfect fit for me. Um, so the trajectory um, has some lessons in it, which we'll be talking about, some consequences from decisions that I've made. Um, but it was, uh, I kept moving. I kept moving real fast. Uh, how about you? Yeah, I was just thinking, just side note, really remarkable to think about when we were at Georgetown, your company, MSNBC, didn't exist, nor did mine. Right. Be, right. So oh my God. it's yeah. amazing to think that we're both with companies that didn't even exist. Right. There you go. So think about career path. I certainly did not imagine I'd be working at a global company platform, internet platform. I mean, I don't even think I had email at Georgetown. Right. Um, but yeah, I took a very traditional path as well. I went to Georgetown, straight out of Georgetown, like many Hoyas do, went to law school. And um, you know, we were talking about this with your about your daughter who's in law school mm -hmm. and you know, got a law firm job, did, <laughs> you know, everyone said you'd be a litigator. Um, and then I had this opportunity, chance of a lifetime. Uh, I worked on a political campaign that was not supposed to uh, end the way it did, but my candidate won. Uh, and as he asked mm. me to join him as his chief of staff, I was very young. I didn't, I had no idea what I was doing, but I said, yes. And I never imagined that I'd stay there for as long as I did. I was there for 13 years mm. and, um, you know, he was running for office and didn't win. And that for me was a reset moment, much like I know you taught, you're very candid about uh, things that happened to you at CBS, which we'll get to, but it was a reset moment and I had to reinvent myself and I was in San Francisco and uh, tech was really hot. And so I wanted to get a job in it and it was hard, same as you, like the whole way, you know, we make it sound so easy. Like we have these great jobs, we're so happy, but there were so right. many points along the way where we've had to make decisions. Um, so yeah, it's it's been a journey and I, I really want to talk to you about because you're so transparent and vulnerable about this, about the firing, mm -hmm. right? And what a reset moment that was for you. So how did you get your confidence back? What, like, what happened? Well, that was actually a, a big part of building Know Your Value was that, that year after being fired. Um, because I, in, in doing the research for the book, which was picking apart all the mistakes that I've made, um, in, especially in the year after I was fired, um, you know, women take rejection, the answer no, or getting fired incredibly deeply personally. It is traumatic for women. And um, I have learned along the way that that's, that's one of the mistakes we make, that we don't have a more disciplined, um, calm uh, reaction to failure or to no. Um, because, you know, I learned in dialectical behavioral therapy that two things can be true at the same time and that there is emotion mind and wise mind. Wise mind is when you're calm, is when you're in control of the situation and when you can see things from 20,000 feet. Emotion mind is when you're deeply upset, you're unregulated. And we are dysregulated every time anyone says no. 
Um, while men can get 10 no in a 10 no's in a day, and that's a good day for them because they know tomorrow's gonna they're gonna get 10 yeses. For some reason, there's this attitude about no's versus yeses that men can handle like you know, like cards, like a deck of cards that they just dealing out. And we're just like thinking about every no and picking it apart and feeling it personally. And when I got fired, it was so personal. And there were things that I did that reflected that. Like I went home and I lied to my kids about it. I, I told them I was just leaving CBS and it was great because we'd have more time together. And both my daughters like did not buy it. One was eight and one was 10. And I won't say which did which, but one was like, you can't leave CBS. That's the only reason the lady at the library likes me. And the other one got really sad and said, you shouldn't leave CBS. You love it so much. Like kids call you out, you know, yeah. don't lie to yourself. Don't lie to your kids. <laughs> That's like lesson number one. It's okay. Your kids should see you fail. And in business and in life, uh, we're going to see a lot of failures. And I think we need to see them immediately as building blocks or as challenges that, you know, tomorrow I'm going to not fail at that, or tomorrow I'm going to get that yes, instead of something that really hurts. And so after I got fired, I spent like a year looking for a job. I didn't think I'd ever get a job in the business again. Um, I thought my age had a big reason to do with it, which boy, have I proved that wrong. Um, and a lot of other women have too. Um, but I walked around into these interviews with the word fired written on my forehead because I had taken it so personally that I felt you know, it was something shameful about myself. While men would be like, oh, there's a word that they would use to the, you know, F them or, you know, you, <laughs> and I'm going to, you know what, firing me. Great. I'm going to go to the firm across the street. I'm going to burn your firm down with the work I do there. I mean, that's their, their whole, like, and I just need a little bit of that, I think. Um, or we need a little bit of joy or a little bit of humor about our failures. It's some way to survive them that, is not so personal that we find ourselves in emotion mind. Because two things can be true at one time. You can get fired from your job and you also can still be very good at what you do and have a lot to offer. And you can't let that firing own you, which is what I did. And, and I wrote a lot about it because I think it's a mistake a lot of us make where we carry around all those rejections. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, I think about just applying for jobs Right. Getting rejected a lot. Oh, like, like as soon as I hit send, right? It wasn't <laughs> even like they were looking at my resume. So it was just like, how do you get in and how do you build that resilience, right? How do you reinvent yourself? Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like you, part of writing the book was reinventing yourself. Yeah. Well, part of writing the book was just kind of facing what my career um experience had done to my psyche and whether or not that whether or not that was okay because I didn't know my value when I was 40 years old and so I thought that's a real problem and so when I started writing know your value the first time around I started realizing that, that my story is so similar to so many women in fact women after that book came out would rush me they would rush the stage or rush to me on streets and be like, oh my God, I read your book. That was me. Oh my God, I read your book. I got a raise. Oh my God, I read your book and I quit. Oh my God, I read your book and I got divorced. I mean, I've heard it all. <laughs> um, and it's because it was incredibly relatable. And yes, it was me. I, I, I thought in, I actually felt worse about some of my failures because I was, uh, my parents had provided incredible education for us and it was very, um, grew up in a, a multilingual family with, you know, the ability to have a, a view of the world um, from many different perspectives with my mother as an accomplished artist from Czechoslovakia and my father from Poland uh, serving a national security advisor. And yet my issues were as fundamental as everybody else's. And that's what women would tell me. I mean, know your value started as um, a negotiation story, but mm -hmm. it ended as a whole concept on life. You can't get value back in any relationship uh, un unless you know yours. <laughs> so uh, I 
I did it because I thought I had something really important to share. Well, I think it is really important. And thank you because I have read the book and uh, it's chock full of phenomenal advice. What's your top three pieces of advice from the book? Hmm. Well, um, I, I actually have updated advice. I'm, I'm going to update it because I, I've learned so much in the past year with this uh, uh, partnership I have with Forbes and the 50 over 50 list. But so my, my number one piece of advice, actually, I'm going to have to put an update, updated introduction in the book now. You can call my publisher because my number one piece of advice for every woman out there, especially if you're starting out. And Marissa, I wonder if you had similar stresses on you that were unnecessary, um, but don't rush. You have mm. a very long runway. Calm down. Um, there are so many opportunities for women um, that last a long time. And I think I rushed too much. I think I always felt like there was a clock ticking that 60 minutes. Like yeah. I always felt that about everything. And it led to some mistakes um, and to some consequences, some that were dire because rushing is, it leads to mistakes. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. I think women always, I mean, Marissa, did you feel when you were starting out your career, like you had to like keep moving, you know, there was this like pressure. There was not only, I mean, yes, there was pressure, I think on myself from me, uh, from society. Yeah. Also, like That's the, wor was, that's the worst was, enemy. I was in at a law firm, right? We were mm -hmm. in billable hours. We were, we were, our value was how many hours of the day you could bill, right? And that, mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. that gets into your mindset, right? But I also think even for me, and I want to talk to you a little about this too, because we, we chose different paths, like the, the women's clock ticking, right? Mm -hmm. And children and the rush, and do you have it and do you not? And, you know, I don't have children. I didn't have an opportunity to, but I've never regretted it. And sort of there were periods in my time in my life where I was just like, okay, this is the time. And I, right. I remember that there, there was these two women who uh, we were in, they were giving me advice on mentoring me. And at one point one stopped me and she's like, hold on, have you thought about freezing your eggs? And it was mm -hmm. a little jarring, but I was so appreciative that somebody actually had that conversation because it is you, it's a decision and you feel like that, that clock, right? So that you mm -hmm. have, you have your personal clock, you have your professional clock. And, you know, I think that we, we put that pressure on ourselves, but you're right. The mistakes that you make when you're going so fast, you don't stop and And they're dire. They're dire. They right? are. They are. <laughs> the mistakes are dire. I mean, I, I can share like the worst day of my life, um, but I, I will just to um, tap on what, to what you said about freezing eggs. Um, not sure what your decision was, but I know three people right now. They're in the process of doing that. And I think, I think that it's a great opportunity for women who, you know, you, you want to, you want to feel right about your personal decisions and, and choosing someone to marry, you know, is one of the biggest decisions you'll make in your life. And if, if that doesn't end up being in the cards, then that's just a really great option because you can still have a family or you still may meet someone. We have a long runway. We have women working in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s fully functioning. So, and I, you know, a lot of women in their 50s who are deciding to have children, however, are, are unbelievable mothers. And you would argue, perhaps, I mean, if I could start to have both my girls now, they would probably appreciate me more. <laughs> I'm sure they would say that. Um, you know, I, I've learned so much. So I don't think there's a perfect time to have kids. There never is. But why do you have to be forced to one 10 or 20 year period of time when you can have them, you're not. So that clock isn't ticking anymore. Which but, is phenomenal, right? For this yeah. generation. Yeah. But in terms of rushing, you know, I just, uh, I was in the biggest rush and I don't know why. Um, I knew what I wanted to do. And um, I felt like, I, I guess, especially in the TV business back when I started, you know, I felt like 
you had a shelf life. I'm not sure that that's a fair thing to say, but that's how I felt. And, and I worked all shifts. I said yes to everything. My first network job was overnights. And um, I had my second child on overnights. And I was driving from Norwalk, Connecticut to CBS News in New York City. And their dad was driving from Norwalk, Connecticut to New Haven, where he was an investigative reporter. And there were so many reasons why that led to strain in the family, just unnecessary strain. Like the, I had to take that job. Why did I have to take that job? You know, could I wait? Could life interrupt work a little bit and work interrupt life? I never saw it that way. And I think that's, a mistake. And I think we all in the family suffered from that feeling of, of I had to do everything when it came. And, uh, you know, there's so many important lessons from this story. I have to tell it. Um, and that is that I was one, uh, I had my second child, Carly, um, and I went back to work maybe eight weeks after I wasn't ready to go back. My body wasn't ready. My baby wasn't ready. And I wasn't getting paid in during, it was a freelance job. My big network break was freelance and really low pay. And I was just worried about all sorts of things that when I look back, I just roll my eyes at myself, um, especially now seeing the runway that women have. Um, and the time that you can enjoy things that I didn't take. Um, but there was one horrific day, the, the worst day of my life, where I came home on a Friday and I was exhausted because I never slept during the week. It was so hard to sleep and then try and get up and have time with the baby and the toddler. And um, I was trying to pay the part-time nanny and talk, and I was on a third floor, and I was holding the baby, and I literally fell down the stairs with her. <sighs> and it is a gut-wrenching story. I will not make this entire audience want to press leave or start crying, but I'll cut to me in the hospital with her surrounded by doctors, wondering if her back was broken. And I like hold on to the side of the wall and slide down the wall. And my face is looking at the speckled granite and I'm pressing my face into the ground at the hospital, praying like somehow put me on that table. Like how did, how did I let this happen? Mm -hmm. And it took years. She had a broken leg and she's like beautiful and, you know, graduated from Dartmouth and is a runner and, you know, totally physically fine and it but it it impacted the whole family and the trajectory of our family from that moment on see these are the mistakes i'm talking about when you're rushing um you're rushing and something so calamitous happens that it is a trauma that you don't even know what the reverberations are un until years later when you look back at it and you want to avoid that. And there's no ne necessity for this rush. Um, it, it was absolutely, it was like kind of my darkest moment. Um, and uh, that's the consequences of rushing. Among a, a, many other things, that you lose along the way when you're in a rush because you're in a motion mind. So you're not thinking, in, you're in a motion mind, your ability to think goes from five to one. So mm. you're missing everything. And, and Marissa, like that's something, I don't know when you're talking to women and in how you live your life, if you've taken the sense in that we've got to stop missing out on the moments because of these careers. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. So do you slow down now? What do you do to slow down? How do you, how do you remind yourself to? So um, I have learned, I do dialectical behavioral therapy, which I suggest everybody in like, I, if they, they're even looking at mainstreaming it in schools. They call it emotion regulation. They call it a lot of different things, but it is looking at things differently, doing things literally differently. Um, meditating, which is something that like my daughters would laugh and be like, my mom meditating. 
<laughs> but I do it. And it's 10, 20 minutes. And there is data that shows brain scans before one does meditation. Um, and after, like after six months, like it, it there is, a, it, it impacts your brain. You learn to think slower. Um, I'm a big runner. I'm a very amped up person. I do a morning show. Um, I will say that now that we're to four hours, I am working on cutting out anything that's not fun. Anything For you. that is not fun. <laughs> I just won't do it. Yeah. <laughs> The luxuries of being 50, right? The the awareness that like Yeah. I mean, they I they have, people have come out for me for another book and for that. I'm just like, no, I can't yeah. that's not fun. I can't do it. <laughs> so that's my key. But uh, how about you? I mean, is is there a way, is there a change in your attitude from when you were younger? Yes, I definitely would agree 100 percent about slowing down. I too have made tons of mistakes, right? Not as scary as yours. Um, but because rushing through things, right. I told the story, I was fundraising for my boss and I was not paying attention. I was running around, it was holidays and I left about $50,000 worth of checks in the garage. No, that's not good. <laughs> uh, I went back, I realized it, I found them, but I, it was like, I nearly had a heart attack, you know, think, <laughs> Things not, you know, slowing down, not paying attention to health issues, mm -hmm. right? Oh, it's nothing. I'm not going to go to the doctor. Um, but you do, you, you have to have self-awareness. You have to pay attention. I, like you, am a runner. Um, mm -hmm. But even that, I've tried to slow down. Being, you know, being kind to my joints. I've definitely been during COVID walking a lot. I love Pilates, mm -hmm. mindfulness. I wouldn't call it meditation, but I definitely, it is a form of meditation. I'm just sort of grounding yourself before the day starts because the day starts and man they're like busy you can really get into that hamster wheel of you know meeting after meeting after meeting and so it's just blocking my calendar right just little mm -hmm. things stopping for lunch pause get you know it's 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 i mean with the world of internet now it stuff moves a lot faster for sure um Definitely. you mentioned the 50 50 list. And uh, you talked a little bit about negotiation with know your value. Mm -hmm. And Forbes, pretty important partner. Was there a negotiation there? You know, um, yes, but the, the, I actually think the, the most important negotiation I ever made in terms of know your value was a negotiation that I didn't have. So I'll tell you about Forbes, but I want to start with how know your value started um, because I had negotiations. I mean, in the book, you'll see many of them went terribly. I mean, there were people who said no and many times and no, I mean, there are so many more no's than there are yeses, by the way, for everybody in our audience. Like every day is hard in the world of TV news and any industry. And, you know, to get to yes is very hard on anything. And so I just don't want to like paint a picture of, okay, here's, here's the magic words to say and you will get a yes. It's hard and you have to keep, keep going at it. But the other thing that I learned in the research that I did for Know Your Value is that women don't take, we don't like to take risks. We want everything like in the box and we want to be told what our next thing is and we want just it all to fit. And if it's not in like the plan, it's very, it throws us off. And um, men just innately take more risks and I always urge women to take more risks. So, so I, I, with Know Your Value, I kind of went, I turned my playbook around. I had written the book. It was a huge success. And I was really excited about the success of it, but I wanted to do events and I wanted to show a lot of this stuff on stage. And a lot of it is the basic stuff, how you walk in a room, posture, eye contact, conversation making, you know, like who teaches you this stuff? No one taught me this stuff. And I thought it was hard in the TV business trying to sort of be in job interviews or try to get um, 
promotions and I didn't know how to do it. So I thought this is, this is the stuff everyone needs. And it's, I, you know, I think women who have made it past a certain level have figured out their way. It's the women from the bottom up that I'm looking at in terms of knowing their value. And, um, I was like, you know, I can make an event. I can get sponsors. I could go back to Hartford, Connecticut, where I was a anchor and everyone knows me there. And I have friends there who work in PR and that we could work, we could make this event together and I'll get sponsors from the major companies there, Aetna, TIA Craft, and, you know, I'll just pull it together. And I got a venue, the Hartford Downtown Marriott, and um, I created this concept where I asked my old TV station and I was getting so creative with all my ideas. I, I literally made an iPhone video and this is like 12 years ago. And I said, hi, it's Mika Brzezinski. Remember me, WFSB channel three? Well, I'm coming back to Hartford for my very first Know Your Value event. And I wanna have a competition. If you know your value and you can communicate it effectively, get on your phone and make a video just like me in one minute or less. Tell me why you have value. No matter what you do, no matter where you are, tell me why you have value and why you need 10, why you should be given $10,000 on the spot. Also, look at how many times you delete that, okay? And then send in your best one. And I created this competition where we had five finalists and on, we coached them and we had this great moment on stage, okay? And so the event happens it is sold out. People love the three words, know your value. There's a waiting list. There are pe There is people who have walked there who are in like a line outside. We stuff them in to the Marriott downtown Hartford ballroom. And uh, we had CEOs. My friend Gail King came up as the keynote and like they loved her. And while she was getting off stage, she was like, Mika, you are onto something here. You are totally onto something. And um, the competition happened. And it was the Know Your Value, Grow Your Value bonus competition. And I had this woman from Madison, Connecticut, who had been fired from Wall Street and had started a secondhand store for moms in downtown Madison on Main Street. And she wanted to use the money to build a website. I had a mom from Avon, Connecticut, who had three daughters and her husband left her for another woman. And she wanted to build a gym in her basement so she could like teach Pilates while she raised her daughters. We had a woman from Houston who had all these dresses she had designed and she had just moved into town. She wanted to be a dress designer. We had this 28 year old single mom who never went to college. No one in her family had gone to college. She was an assistant in like Middletown, Connecticut, Jennifer Hotchkiss. And she had this incredible voice. And she was like, I want to be the boss someday. I want to go to college. I want to go to Bay Path College and get a degree. But I've got a kid. I don't know how to do this, but I, I, wanna, I wanna use the money for that. And the woman from Madison, Connecticut actually won she had this incredible pitch and she had like a tube coming out of her arm. And when she won, the place went wild. Her name was Darcy Sorda. And I was hugging her. She was hugging me. And I was like, are you okay? And she's like, oh, I had heart surgery 48 hours ago. The doctor told me not to come. I was practicing on the, on the, the like stretcher as they put, put her into surgery. And uh, she's like, there's a wheelchair backstage. I'm like, go, go backstage. <laughs> but it was a great message. And then this woman is like pulling on my dress and she's like, please let me have the microphone. And I'm supposed to be like, you know, closing out the event. So I say, I think we have a last minute announcement. And this woman, she's like in her seventies, I think she takes the microphone and she goes, you all are wonderful. But Jennifer Hotchkiss, the runner up, I'm the CMO of Bay Path College. I want you to come in on Monday and we're going to give you a full ride. The whole place like wow. literally did what you just did. <laughs> they all went, oh, and we all started crying. Everybody in the room started crying and I started crying. And I was like, this is, this is know your value. If you don't put yourself out there like these women did, you have no idea what could happen for you. So you've got to put yourself out there. And did we not just learn that by this moment more than anything I could have said today? So the event was amazing. It turned a profit. And here's, here's the final tip. 
that I was starting out with. It wasn't a negotiation. I never asked permission to NBC to do this. I took a risk. If I had asked, they would have said no. Instead, I took the receipts. I brought it to them. And I said, I did this. I think you might've heard about it. And we ended up going into partnership. And we did 16 events across the country over the past decade. And now we have Know Your Value at MSNBC. We've got a website that's flourishing. And now we've got 50 over 50. And we're headed to the big event in Abu Dhabi in March. But this is 10 years of building all started on a risk, on something I definitely would not have been allowed to do. Yeah. So I love the 50 over 50 list. It's a list I never knew I needed. It's super Mm -hmm. inspiring, but I can only imagine how difficult it is to choose and how many people you get called from that aren't on the list. Yeah. You know what? Well, it's an annual list. So (laughs) There's always also next year, list, right? And it, there's Asia now. There's Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and the U.S. list, which nominations are open now. Nominate yourself or nominate someone you know. But there are so many women, and that's the thing. We're in a moment, Marissa. I, I this was not the case. I don't think 20 years ago. Oh, I really yeah. don't. Yeah, I agree. we. We had 10,000 submissions in the very first list. Forbes for 30 under 30, their first list, they had a couple hundred submissions. Think about that. Like there are so many women who deserve to be on this list who are out there actively participating in their life and killing it. Yeah. So I, I love the list and I it's it's expanding like crazy around the world because there is a place for it. Yeah. Awesome. So when I first heard you mention a couple of weeks ago, 30, 50, I was like, oh yeah, 50 is the new 30, <laughs> but it's, tell us, tell us about it because it's super cool. And what I love about it and would love you to touch on is the mentorship piece of the, of yeah. the 30, 50 and mentoring. Um, well, we have, um, we, we decided that the, the list started to like explode around the world and we've gotten such great response. And so the next thing, of course, is I want to do an event. Um, I don't know what the obsession with events is, but um, the concept is to get these women around the world from the 50 over 50 lists and the 30 under 30 lists and to create an event around them and others. The women in between are invited as well. And we have our first event, which is um, on and around International Women's Day in about three weeks in Abu Dhabi. And Hillary Clinton's the keynote. Um, And we're about to announce a whole bunch of other participants and speakers and performers. And we're having this amazing um, fashion show where all the models are over 50, like Paulina Portskova and Iman. And it's just going to be fun, um, as well as really, really... um, constructive on the mentorship side. So we're going to have tons of mentoring constructs within the four-day event itself. And then we're going to go to a women's college and mentor the women there, sort of leaving the host city better than we found it. And we're going to have a lot of messages for the region, some that, you know, going to be a little uncomfortable, but awesome. we're going to speak out. Yeah. So as you think about mentorship, right? I, I, you know, was thinking about my own mentors and I really didn't have that many female mentors. I didn't. Yeah. Right? No. And, um, what, what role do you play as a mentor now? Well, I I'm everyone's Mika, Mika, mentor me. Mentor I, me. I know, you know, I love it. I'm, I'm more like, I, I'm interested in how you do this because I just, I found mentoring to kind of be a, um, a word that I really, it's more about sponsoring proving to women their value. Like um, I did a book with a young woman who worked for Morning Joe, who I just thought was fantastic. Turns out she was a dreamer who had a hard time getting to where she was. And I thought her story was so fantastic. I made her co-author of a book, Earn It. And I gave her the money. And um, it's just sort of like, I think at this point, it's paying it forward. It's finding ways to prove to women that they have value. That to me, I mean, mentorship is great. Giving advice is great, but it's more like grab them by the hand and drag them down the hall and push them into that meeting. Um, There was a young girl from Cornell who wants to be an intern at Morning Joe. 
And um, she already has worked like in some great places and totally is qualified. But I, she called me, I had her call me and she had this kind of mousy, small voice. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. (laughs) Open your computer right now. Okay. I need you to email my executive producer. His email address is Alex dot at Corson. And she was like typing. She's like, am I supposed to be typing this? I'm like, yes. And copy me, me morning Mika one. And she's typing. And I said, dear Alex. And I said, and I literally um, told her what to write in the letter and told Alex why she was great in her voice. <laughs> and she was like, can I say that? I said, yes, your experience on oversight and, you know, in politics in Washington, D.C. makes you perfect for this job. And Mika Brzezinski, you know, and so I, she was just not used to touting for herself and not used to using someone's name as a sponsor. And, you know, I just was like, come on, let's just do this. You're now, now, now proofread it. And I stayed on the phone and I was like, press send press send. I'm not hanging up till you press it. I think it was probably the most stressful phone call she's ever had. So I guess that's how I look at it. It's just like getting, getting your, rolling your sleeves up and getting involved. I get right in there with people and like find out the problem and push them forward and show them. Um, Because I think it's like advice is easy to say. It's much harder to help people execute it. Action. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Bank of America is dedicated to bringing diverse women talent into the company and to supporting the economic empowerment of women around the world. Recognizing the vital role women play in driving economic growth, Bank of America helps women make connections to build their businesses and make meaningful contributions to local communities. Through partnerships with multiple organizations, Bank of America has helped more than 75,000 women entrepreneurs access mentoring and the capital they need to lead, create positive change, and grow their businesses. To learn more, visit bankofamerica.com slash women. What would you like the power to do? Copyright 2021 Bank of America Corporation. Okay, I'm going to remind um, our participants to put in questions in the chat, Q&A, and I'm, I know we're supposed to have Q&A, so, but I have tons more. So are you up for lightning round? Let, oh, yeah, let's do it. Let's both do it. Okay. Uh, favorite app on your phone? Um, mm, the weather? I'm traveling a lot. Sorry. Like Spotify. Yours? Me- Spotify. Okay, hold on. I know I'm going to find a new one. I'm finding a new one. I'm finding a new one. You need a new one. You know, I took my, I took my, my podcast, which does not have as many listeners as Joe Rogan. Um, but I took it off Spotify. I just thought, no, not doing it. I'm just taking it off. But that, so (laughs) it was, it was, that's the past. I'm finding a new one. Weather. Okay. New one. Okay. Um, we did that one. Uh, best advice you've ever been given. Well, it's slow down. How about you? It's that and also like financial literacy. Get a financial planner. Ooh, that's really I good. I did it when I was 30 because I was Ooh. in so much debt from law school. Jealous. School. Good idea. Okay. Yep. Best advice. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What still excites you? Oh, my girls. How about you? Innovation. Just mm. the speed of innovation and like the the things that we can do now. I mean, like I said, our companies didn't even exist. So companies that people are going to be working at or don't, they're not so even, cool. Right. Yeah, um, absolutely. What books are on your nightstand? Um, hmm, mm, range. <sighs> Me too. I have a lot have of you, that. have you read range? No. Okay. It's really good. It's just, it's about all of this. I mean, and it's sort of about having, having range and, and being, you know, the, the importance of actually being good at a lot of really small things as opposed to really big things and, and what, why range is important. It's, it's really good. It's amazing. The one by written the sports illustrated guy. Uh, I'll have to look it up. Someone told me something. My doctor told me about one of these books. Okay, I wrote it's it down. It's so Rain, good on my list. On my yeah, list. range is good. Yeah. Um, 
one thing in your purse you can't live without? Uh, <laughs> so one thing I've been looking for all day, uh, a really good lipstick that doesn't dry out my lips. <laughs> ah. nice. Lip balm <laughs> yeah. with a nice color. Lip balm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. How about you? Same lip balm. Like that I was using my iPhone, but I, I could live without that. It's I still fun. haven't found a good one. Yeah. <laughs> I use this one that's like a, it's a lip balm. I don't, it's, I think it's arrow and it has a natural color and it okay. it's to your lips mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and they have out. different tints and it's good. Cause like, yeah, I have a lot of lipsticks that <laughs> I lose. <laughs> that was the tip for my mom. She's like, when you're not feeling good, put on some lipstick. It just feels okay. good. <laughs> Great. <laughs> hey, mom. Thanks hey. mom. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Uh, any lightning round from you? Well, um, so what advice do you have for young women beginning their career? I think you're like endless opportunities. Don't box yourself in. Okay. Um, How can women better support each other and empower each other? Just show up and be supportive. Don't be a hater. Don't be jealous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What can our male colleagues do to be better allies in the workplace? Step aside and let us in the door. Hmm. I would say ask more questions because um, they're not mind readers. And sometimes I think women need need a little bit of a nudge to say what they need uh, to make it to like if they're really good at their job, they might need something in order to be able to sustain it. Um, how can women break into the insiders club? Well, I think there's, there's a lot of ways. One, you can elbow your way in, but there's no substitute for actually good work and quality work, right? Mm-hmm. And I think going back to, it's like tooting your own horn and not being afraid to, to not only know your value, but then articulate and show your value. Exactly. I think we often think people will notice yeah. the work that we're doing. And that is a really big mistake. You have to learn how to articulate it all the time. And I think you can wrap it around being passionate about what you do, being excited about what you've done and sharing it in a joyful way. It doesn't have to be, you know, like uh, something that you're, you know, feel you have to say uncomfortably, be excited about what you're doing. Um, Can you speak to authenticity and the importance of being your true self in the workplace? I'll add to this as well. I think a big part of this is actually, you know, sort of a side note to not know your value, but really know yourself and really Mm -hmm. know what makes you comfortable, what makes you uncomfortable and makes you comfortable, right? So it's hard to be your authentic self if you don't, if you're not comfortable in your own skin, Mm -hmm. right? And I, and I say that in the way of, of, you know, even when I was working at the law firm, I, I was my authentic self, but I also really felt like this isn't the right thing for me. There's something else, right? And so I go back to like, you take your risks, but like it, authentic, authenticity is just, for me, there's the, the taking risks, saying things that you may be fearful of saying, uh, sharing a little bit about yourself, but like know yourself. And so like, until you know yourself, it's hard to be really authentic. And so I would add to that, that it takes a long time to do that takes a long time to get to authenticity. It gets a long time to get to knowing yourself and knowing your value. And um, I think sometimes in forums like this, it almost sounds like too simple. And I just want to point out that like you start out feeling like a speck in the universe, like a tiny speck that doesn't exist. And you're like, how am I ever going to get from point A to point B when I'm just a speck, when I'm, I'm nothing. And then you finally get somewhere and then you're climbing and you're more than a speck, but it takes a long time to get beyond the speck. And I think a truly authentic voice comes from building confidence, from having that first job, that second job, maybe that job you got fired from because you weren't really good at it, you know, like literally fired. Um, early on. It's traumatic. It happens to a lot of people, but experience leads to confidence and confidence leads to authenticity, being able to sort of be your true self, have fun, be funny, be vulnerable, be all those things that everyone truly is, but being allowed to let that out 
comes from experience, which comes from confidence. But I define experience as some success and many failures along a lot of years. And if you look at it that way, then you might be looking at yourself at that, at whatever stage in your career that you're at. And you think, okay, I can do that (laughs) because that's what it's like. It's not like, you know, super bells and whistles and super exciting all the time. It's, it's hard. It's sloggy. It's, you know, crappy. There are bad, bad days. And, um, no matter how successful anyone is, it's like that for a lot of it, before you get to a place of being truly confident and being able to be your authentic self in the workplace, which should be an ultimate goal for a woman. But it's it's very challenging because of the very dip, many different tracks that we are on in life at the same time. I think we really struggle with this. And I think if you know that that struggle exists and you embrace your failures, it will be easier to get to that point of authenticity. Um, Uh, Let's see, another rapid fire for Marissa. The importance of belonging in the workplace. Uh, What does that mean? Because I've got a big answer for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I think authenticity is a piece of it, but I do think it's a culture of connection and um, acceptance and really... Mm -hmm openness to learning about others. So to me, the, yes. And I would add to that, the importance of belonging in the workplace uh, comes from a place of being paid equally. I did not feel like, I did not feel like I belonged until I fixed my pay at MSNBC. In fact, I felt like an imposter. I felt less than, I felt angry, which is a really bad way to feel when you're on live television every day. Um, and, uh, I think women really struggle with feeling like they deserve money and talking about money in a very practical way. Men are like, give me the money, show me the money. And I need more money. And by the way, while you're at it, (laughs) right. And while you're at it, I need more money. And if I'm going to do that as well, you're going to need to pay me more. They have no problem talking about it. While we feel so untoward, we feel so uncomfortable talking about money for ourselves. But when I did fix my pay situation at MSNBC, um, this was like 10 years ago, that was the first day I felt I belonged and it mattered Every penny of it mattered. And um, so that's what belonging, (laughs) that's what belonging is to me, is being paid equally. How do you belong if you're not paid equally? And personally, if I became CEO of any company in this country, it's the first thing I would do. I would look look at the pay and look at and make sure that everybody is equal and I would raise pays that are not equal. Boom, end of story. Um, and, And by the way, any woman who you reward with equal pay, I can't believe I called it a reward, um, will pay it forward in 20 different ways because she knows the importance of feeling like she belongs. Amen. I'm with you. Okay. I know we have Q&A from, I see that there's 62 questions. I'm very unlikely we're going to get through 62. So I think Stephanie, you're going to yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. Like you said, we, we are drowning in excellent questions over here. So much positive feedback on the conversation, um, especially early on in your conversation about the importance of not rushing really, really resonated with a lot of people. And so to circle back to the beginning of your conversation, Mika, you were saying you had three updated pieces of advice in your book. And I think everyone was waiting on two and three. <laughs> oh, Sure. Um, Okay. So it was advice on, okay. So don't rush would be the first. Um, The the second would be to practice advocating for yourself and don't think that you can do it in the moment and don't think that you can wing it. I, that little cell phone trick that I did for the women of Hartford um, all should do. I think you should literally talk on your phone to your phone, to yourself, asking for that raise or having that conversation, that negotiation, I would practice with friends, 
with a glass of wine, you know, on a Friday night with a bunch of girlfriends and stand up on a chair and speak in front of your friends and realize how that feels because that's what a negotiation feels like. It feels very exposing, like you're on stage. So don't think that you're good at it just because you've got it all up here. It's got to come out right and you've got to um, have the right body language, the right facial connection, the, your eye, the whole thing is hard to do if you haven't done it. So practice, practice, practice. And then um, number, th <laughs> number three um, would be pay it forward. And it, the minute you can, anytime you can, start paying it forward to other women. I do this all the time. And I get nothing back from many of them except to thank you. But it's how we're getting somewhere. I sometimes think when we do things en masse, it's great, great message, that's wonderful. But you do something for one woman and she is going to pay it forward the rest of her life the way you did. And so those are my three things. And I think they, they, they fit well um, as like a little philosophy that you carry around to remind yourself every day. Fantastic. One of the other questions we've got here is, what is the most challenging thing you've experienced in your career? Marissa? Well, I mean, the, 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 we need five more hours for that. No, I think, I think the reinvent, right? I think pivoting from a very traditional uh, profession, legal career, and going to tech and the, um, at a startup, right? And, and getting comfortable with the experience, getting comfortable with the age um, was a big, was a big challenge. I took a pay cut, right? I didn't negotiate well. <laughs> I took a calculated risk. Um, working with, I, I reported to someone 20 plus years younger than me straight out of college. Um, but I learned a lot and I grew a lot. And I think, you know, th those challenges really, um, really help your growth. I'm a totally different person as a result of all that. I'm a lot more patient. Yeah. What about you, Mika? Well, um, I think the biggest challenge for me, the getting fired, we, but I've talked about that. I, I think for me, it's been the bad hours. Um, and I, I have now completed an entire career of really bad hours. And the impact on my body and on my mind and on my family, um, you know, I know, I'm not sure how that's going to like come out in the wash. <laughs> um, and it's a decision that I made, that I've made. And it's just, they've always come back to me. I get up, you know, really, really early and I work a very long day. And I used to work overnights and then I worked mornings and I've always been sort of confronted with the concept of bad hours and I've taken it and it's, it's taken a huge toll and it just is in general, um, a, a physical and mental challenge. Our next question here, how do you find a balance between wanting to be a career woman and developing a thriving personal life? Mika, you go. <laughs> okay. I got great advice, but I have so much to say. Here's the thing. It's very important. I will say this to all women who want to have a family. That is really important and do not put that off. And if, I mean, if you spend half the time looking for the right job for yourself, you got to look for the right guy. And if it's something you want, you got to look for it. And I also think that you shouldn't be afraid to say it to people that you're dating. Um, like don't, it's not creepy at all. This is something you want and be proud of that in your life. Um, and I would suggest don't forget to, to, to go for it if it's something you really want, however you can make it happen. Um, and there's no good time for kids or for pregnancies or for all these things when it comes to work. It doesn't mesh. There's always something that cancels something out, but we've, that's why we've got the long runway that we built for you, okay? So you don't have to rush and you can enjoy one or the other or even both at the same time, but you don't have to feel like you have to do something. It, you know, 
cranking it out at that moment. So um, my advice, God, I mean, my daughters are both like, who's this person? Cause I'm like, yeah, if you want to get a job this summer, you can, you know, but you know, what about like going in on a big trip? You know I mean? Like I just really don't believe in the rush. I really don't. It's my biggest regret in life. Um, and so uh, if that family is something you want, have it and understand it will interrupt your work. And your work will interrupt your family at times and you'll, you'll be okay. You'll make the right decision. And work isn't going away. Like work no. is always coming. Look at the 50 over 50 list. It's not going away. <laughs> it's not going away. I'm going to four hours. <laughs> <laughs> and then one just last earth. final quick Q&A question for you is, uh, what's a useful daily habit or routine that you have? Marissa? I think for me, some sort of physical activity because it clears my mind, right? It's either the beginning of the day, the end of the day, even if it's just walking around the block, something fresh air. And I rarely miss one meal with mm. my husband, whether it's lunch or dinner. And that's my reset moment as well of just sort of not thinking about work, just having fun. Um, I'd like to note that I had, I got married late in life. So those of you who feel like you're rushing, don't rush. Don't rush. Don't rush. Um, I run and I've kind of really gotten into it lately. I'm a big runner. Um, and the, the only thing that really interrupts that is if I have the opportunity to spend time with any of my girls, I will be there. So I have two two daughters that I um, actually carried and gave birth to. And then I have a couple of others as well. I picked up along the way and um, I love all my girls. So it's a, you know, it's either running or my girls. Fabulous. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, everyone, to hear from Mika and Marissa. We're so grateful to have had this incredible conversation kick off our virtual Women's Forum programming series. We have a lot more great Women's Forum programming taking place virtually in 2022, including our next event, which is on Thursday, March 24th, and that's called Putting Paper, The Writing Journey, um, where we've assembled some fabulous alumni authors to discuss their inspiration, the writing and editing process, um, and what it's like to navigate the publishing world. Um, if you'll visit womensforum.georgetown.edu, you can get some more information as well as a posting of this recording in the coming days. We look forward to, uh, to getting us all together again soon. And thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Marissa. You're great. Thank you. Thank you. Bank of America is dedicated to bringing diverse women talent into the company and to supporting the economic empowerment of women around the world. Recognizing the vital role women play in driving economic growth, Bank of America helps women make connections to build their businesses and make meaningful contributions to local communities. Through partnerships with multiple organizations, Bank of America has helped more than 75,000 women entrepreneurs access mentoring and the capital they need to lead, create positive change, and grow their businesses. To learn more, visit bankofamerica.com slash women. What would you like the power to do? Copyright 2021 Bank of America Corporation.